you know, we've talked for years about coaching leaders through what keeps them awake at night. Mm. And the number one thread I've seen 20 years, number one tension that will keep you awake at night are people tensions. Mm. And I stayed in the book, the two biggest lies from hell I ever believed. When we get to here, it'll be easier. And when I hire this next person, it'll solve all our problems. <laughs> And they're both myths. You know, it gets more complicated. There's more personalities. You know, there's more responsibility. You know, all of that. And so this was in a desire. We talk about the gears of growth, culture, team, and system in our coaching. This was in a desire to really make public this framework we had been coaching on and around for years um, called the Killer Team Framework. Welcome to season three, episode three of the Missional Marketing Podcast. My name is Bart Blair. I'm the co-host of the show, and I want to thank you for tuning in. Whether you're watching this on our YouTube channel or uh, listening to it on your favorite podcasting app, if you haven't subscribed, we want to remind you to do that. And if you haven't left us a rating or review, make sure that you do so. Uh, Our goal is to help your church grow um, by leveraging effective communications and digital marketing. We want to help you expand your digital footprint in your community so that you can reach more people for Jesus. And if this podcast is helping you do that, We love the feedback. Let us know. And please make sure that you share it with friends and other ministry leaders that you know who you think might be able to benefit from the content that we are creating. Uh, Today, we have a guest who is a return guest on our show, Mr. Sean Lovejoy. Uh, When we interviewed him, actually Jason interviewed him in the first season of our podcast, and Jason walked away from it saying... I got to have that guy on again. Uh, he learned so much in his first interview with uh, Sean. We saw, said, we'll bring Sean back for another interview so Jason can learn more about being an effective leader. Um, that's partially true. Partially, the reason that we brought Sean back onto the show is that he's recently released a new book called Building a Killer Team. And we thought this would be such a great conversation uh, for our friends and our family in the church world, people who are building ministry teams. I think that you're really going to enjoy this conversation. So again, thanks again for tuning into the show. And uh, here's the CEO of Missional Marketing, Jason Hamrock with Sean Lovejoy. Well, Sean, welcome back to the show. So good to see you. How you doing? Jason, great to see you guys. Love what you guys do. And um, I, I love everyone, but I like you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we <laughs> feelings mutual. <laughs> thanks for thanks for being on here. I I know you got a lot going on, and and um, so glad to have you back because we're gonna we're gonna dive into your brand new book. Uh, but before we do that, give our uh, um, listeners just a quick update on on your story, your ministry, what you've been up to, and also talk about this thing called Courage to Lead Coaching Services. What's that all about? So I'll hand it off to you. Yeah. So, you know, for people who don't know who I am or my story, I was a real estate developer turned church planter, turned mega church pastor, turned coach. And uh, uh, I began coaching pastors 20 years ago, just kind of how to get better between Sundays and how to become a better leader and how to build a good team and simple systems that can scale and all of that stuff. I always felt like a business guy or an executive pastor trapped in a senior pastor's body. Hmm. And, um, just had a knack for coaching so much. So I recognized that desire and gift about myself much better than my preaching. Mm. You know, I, I made the second scariest decision of my life to hand off the church I birthed in my living room, you know, and try to go all in on this coaching thing. Um, seven years ago, as of the time of this recording, and it's just been an amazing ride since then. We have 20 coaches now. We have a marketplace division, which rests at CourageToLead.com, and a pastor's division at CourageousPastors.com. And I'm literally having the time of my life. I have to pinch myself on a weekly basis. And when you're running in your lane and you know God's using you for something significant, you know, you, you literally have to pinch yourself. And that's the way I live and breathe these days. Yeah, isn't that the goal for everyone to kind of find that sweet spot? Yeah, where it's, call it's it your never spiritual a job. It's, swagger. Just a, it's, it's an honor. I call it your spiritual, spiritual swagger, and I want every swagger. leader to to steward and maintain or regain, you know, their spiritual swagger. That not not arrogance, but that holy confidence that, like, wait a minute, God called me this and gifted me with this and anointed me to do this. And I, I add value when I do this. Like there's nothing, there's no greater feeling in the world. So, so you, you do a, uh, a lot of coaching and you mentioned both in the secular marketplace, but in with 
pastors with churches. Um, is it all kinds of church leaders that your XPs or lead pastors or comms or what's that look like? Yeah, it's all over the map. I mean, we, we usually coach a leader and or their team, you know, depending upon the scope of work. But what we do is unique because we're not just delivering content. We put a coach with a leader and or their team for a year or more, usually. I mean, it's deep dive, you know, and walk alongside them. But we have we usually have a primary liaison on the team that we're working with and through that recognizes the need for this. So sometimes that's senior pastor, sometimes that's worship pastor, sometimes that's executive vice president, sometimes that's the COO, sometimes it's the worship pastor. You know, it just depends, you know. Um, and so we, we are able to pair them up with a coach regardless. Yeah, you know, I, I see the value in that tremendously because it doesn't matter if you're the seasoned lead pastor for 30 years or you're brand new, everyone needs a coach. Um, you mentioned in your book, which we're going to get to, you actually quoted, uh, or you put a little section there about Tom Brady, mm -hmm. like I, arguably one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL who still has a coach. And yet, you know, he, that's probably the guy who doesn't need one, <laughs> but he's still, I, I will, he's the value in it. Yeah. I will note that I think you referred to him as retired quarterback, Tom Brady in the book, <laughs> yeah, which, which dates the five minutes in which the book got published because <laughs> he was Very retired true. for five minutes. Yeah. So that, that, you know, that's um, so the coaching aspect of it, I think is one of those things where I, I, it seems like ministry leaders, we, we just don't do that enough because we're so busy focusing on the weekends and getting ready for Sunday type of a thing that, um, that just kind of, we, we read about it, but we don't have somebody there walking besides us with a roadmap of how to get better. You and I talked about it last time I was on Jason, it's just the, after 20 years of doing this is still it, what was the number one mistake 20 years ago is still the number one mistake. I see leaders make today isolation, mm. Mm. isolation, and you get isolated, you know, there's personal detriments, but there's professional detriments, you know, um, you can skip over another leader's pain if you're if you put yourself in a in a learning relationship. But if you're isolated, you're recreating the will, man. You're reliving every other leader's pain the hard way. You can literally shortcut and skip over a leader's pain by learning from someone who's further ahead than you are. I've done it. I've lived that. That's my testimony. Yeah, that's so rich. OK, let's. So you you uh, you came out with a new book, and um, I would like to talk a little bit about this book. But the title of it is "Building a Killer Team Without Killing Yourself or Your Team." <laughs> and uh, why did you write this book, and 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 who's the audience for this book? Well, I talked about the number one mistake. You know, we've talked for years about coaching leaders through what keeps them awake at night, mm. and the number one thread I've seen twenty years. Number one tension that will keep you awake at night are people tensions. Hmm. And I stayed in the book, the two biggest lies from hell ever believed. When we get to here, it'll be easier. And when I hire this next person, it'll solve all our problems. <laughs> and they're both myths. You know, it gets more complicated. There's more personalities. You know, there's more responsibility, you know, all of that. And so this was in a desire. We talk about the gears of growth, culture, team, and system in our coaching. This was in a desire to really make public this framework we had been coaching on and around for years um, called the Killer Team Framework. We really help people like how to build that amazing team, you know, without killing them, you know, or without yeah. killing you in the process. I fought for the tagline to keep it in there because mm -hmm. – you know, I, I know guys that are all about building the killer team, but they're killing everybody in the process and killing themselves in the process, killing their marriages in the process. Like, I'm yeah. not for that, you yeah. know, so. Yeah, and we go through everything that's in the book, which, you know, I don't want to go through all the chapters. There's a lot of great chapters in here. Uh, but, the, you know, every every chapter, everybody deals with all this stuff. And it almost, I would make the statement, hopefully you'll you'll agree with the statement that it doesn't matter where you are in the food chain, if you will. This book will add value to your your career, your 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 leadership development, because everybody's leading at some point. You're either leading yourself, or you're leading a team of people. Will that be accurate? Yeah, and there, I'll, you know, I have a business administration undergraduate degree and a master's degree in theology, and I was not taught a single thing in this book. Hmm. 
all <laughs> learning on the job. <laughs> Sean, yes. define a killer team for us. What is a killer team? Great question. I'm so glad you asked. And my coach told me yesterday, the best thing I did for the book was to find it on the back cover. You know, uh, the first definition of the word killer is, of course, to, to, to kill is to be ruthless, to be harsh, to murder, <laughs> you know. But the, the second definition, the adjective description of the book, it means to be strikingly impressive or effective, you know, and that's the kind of team. I want to help guys build strikingly impressive or effective teams. That's a killer team. Hmm. Do you ever arrive? No, I think that's a scary place to be when you think you've arrived because it's people you're in the people business. It's, it's always messy. It's always complicated. You can always get better. You can always get better at it. IQ, you never get better for what you're born with. EQ, your, your self-awareness, you know, ability to manage your emotions and deal with people, but your LQ, your ability to how you leverage your in, impact and influence and your gifting, those can get infinitely better. And for someone who's from Alabama, that's the most encouraging truth in the world. So can you define the difference between a staff and a team? You're using the word team. No. And a lot of people throw that term around in the business world or in the church world, uh, what's the difference between a, a, a staff, the staff of a church or a team in a church, a staff in a corporation organization and a team? What's the difference? Yeah. So I like to say that, you know, I, and I say this in the book that a staff is a group of people who are working together, committed to a collective vision, but killer teams are mutually devoted. They're, they're, they're devoted to the mission, but they're devoted to each other. And I can say that here. I don't say it in the marketplace everywhere, but Acts chapter 2 says they were devoted to the apostles' teaching. So they were devoted to correct doctrine, but they were devoted to the fellowship. They, were, they had each other's backs. They were loyal. The, the nature of relationships in the church were so close. You had people of different races and tribes calling each other brother for the first time in human history. That was huge. And everybody wanted to be on that team. <laughs> that was strikingly impressive or effective. Not just what they said, but like the bond this group of people had. And it was the, the outside world recognized it and wanted a piece of it. it it's what gave cause to the Christian church. Not just the, 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 the Pharisees had been teaching the doctrine. You know, what the church had was the community in which they delivered and lived the doctrine. That was the real power. So in, in the marketplace, it's not your mar it's not your strategy. It's not your product. I mean, Patrick, like Patrick Lencioni says this in the advantage, the competitive advantage in the marketplace. And I would say the church is a highly aligned, highly cohesive leadership team. It's hmm. true. If you're listening to this podcast, you can't see the smile on Sean's face when he's talking about this stuff. This is, it's, it's, uh, it's infectious. If you're watching on our YouTube channel, you see Sean's smile. Uh, we've, we've, we're, we're running in a lane here conversationally that turns his crank clearly. Yep. Yep. I hope they Jason. can tell it just by the tone of my voice. Yeah. Hey, Bart Blair here. I'm the producer of Missional Marketing's Church Growth Interviews podcast. Thanks so much for tuning in. At Missional Marketing, we're passionate about helping churches reach more people for Jesus online. And one of the ways that we do that is by helping churches acquire more new visitors to their website, utilizing the Google Ad Grant. Google offers qualifying nonprofits, including churches, up to $10,000 a month in advertising. That means that you, as a church, could be using Google as one of your primary digital outreach strategies to communicate the gospel and reach more people in your community. If you'd like to learn more, visit our website at missionalmarketing.com and click the link at the top of the page that says Google Grants. We'd love an opportunity to partner with you in your mission to build God's kingdom here on earth. Well, thanks again for listening to our podcast. And now back to the show. Yeah, Jason, you had a follow-up question there? Yeah, yeah um, so I'm, I'm just, I think about the churches we get to serve, I think about the people who listen to this podcast and they're probably going, oh, great, another leadership book, hmm, you know. But the things you're saying that, that go deeper than that. Um, here's a question for you, because I want to help churches understand this. Out of all the churches that you work with or talk to, 
how many, I mean, is there a, it doesn't probably matter the size of the church or even the size of the staff. Are they, are they super dysfunctional? Are they way off base with this stuff? Are they, yeah, they're, you know, we're all equally yoked because we all love Jesus, but you just see all this stuff on the outside that, you know, it, you, you see the catastrophe coming. Does that, does that happen with every church you work with? Yes. Or what's the that look like? Yes. The answer is yes. Though some would disqualify themselves and discredit themselves because we don't have a large staff or, you know, we, we have a lot of part-timers or we have a lot of lay leaders or whatever, you know, um, the truth is, you know, God's not going to send us more than we can handle. So if we can't steward well, the team we have now, then I'll just don't expect more there. growth. Yeah. 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 So it, 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 we got to get better. Sense. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. We got to get better. And in, t- in today's world, especially the fast growing churches, you know, are tempted to use people to get the ministry done. And man, and in, in the on the hills of the pandemic, you know, Vander Blumen and chemistry staffing and all the church staff, they're getting resumes like crazy. Guys are like, I'm done. I don't, I don't care how great the big picture is and the lives that are being changed. This 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 roller coaster is negatively affecting my quality of life and my family. And I'm out. I'm out. Literally. It's affecting my quality of life as a human being to, to make this great thing happen. So we got to we got to circle around. We got to get better loving and serving and caring the people that we're trying to take the hill with. Yeah, we, we, we see that all the time with, with church staff turnover. You know, it, it's and since the pandemic, it is skyrocketed, you know, and now they're trying to find new people. So they just find they're they're looking for the unicorn that doesn't exist, but they hire the person just because they're available. And um, that, and by the way, the pandemic didn't cause it. There's a lot of victim mentality out there wrapped up in that with pastors. It exposed it. It revealed it, not mm-hmm. caused it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we got to take responsibility <laughs> yeah. to get better, you know, as, as leaders. Yeah. Sean, what are what are some things that kill a killer team or prevent a team from being a killer team? What are some practical things as our listeners or our viewers are, are kind of going through their own mental checklist, things that they may love about their team, things they don't love about their team? What are some things that keep a killer team from being a killer team or a potential killer team from being a killer team? Yeah, so so Jesus was full of grace and truth. Mm. And either one out of balance is is incomplete, you know. And so churches in particular are famous, you know, for being nice to a fault and giving grace to a fault. And I'll have pastors call me and they'll say, Well, you know, my worship pastor, this is always a worship pastor, you know, or my student pastor, this. And my question is always, have you told him or her? what you just told me, you know, what the answer is 99 out of a hundred times. Can you guess? Negative. Well, no, not really. I mean, I, 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 you're not being honest. It, it lacks integrity and they don't even know you're frustrated at all. So like grace to a fault, but then also truth to a fault. This, this high honor culture, I really believe in having a, a culture of honor But if I'm not touchable and I'm not approachable and no one can challenge me, what many of these disqualification, many of these situations in where the the leader of the team disqualified themselves morally from continuing in vocational ministry, it was money, sex, or power. Those were just the symptoms. The common thread they all had was that leader allowed a fear-based culture to form within the team. And I was unapproachable. And I was untouchable and no one could challenge me, you know, so it's it's that balance of grace and truth and me being approachable as a leader and everybody on our team being a coachable leader and us committing to honest, robust dialogue, healthy conflict as opposed to artificial harmony. You know, though the, all of those are the ingredients of like a really, really healthy environment, or you know, a toxic, a, a toxic, you know, culture that begins to form on the team. Mm. You mentioned that when you're coaching, it's it's like a year long. I mean, you're sometimes with them at least a year or so. Is that because you you know the church obviously goes through different seasons? 
right? And through those different time frames that. Yeah, I think a good coach, I mean, let's use the Tom Brady analogy for just a moment. You know, like you got to, a, a best coach like watches the player play. Yeah. Has a relationship with them. You know, gets to know the little intricacies of, you know, everything about them. And the longer they coach them, the better they become because, you know, their tendencies, you know, and you're on the sidelines in, 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 in meeting the rest of the team. So the longer you walk with that player, the better coach you are. So I tell leaders, the longer we walk with you, you know, we'll become a better coach. Yeah. And part of our coaching relationship involves like even meeting the key players on the leadership team. So I always tell leaders, man, after we meet the key players on your team, I will instantly become a better coach because I'm going to have my own thoughts from an outside perspective of who's with you, who can't make it to the next level, who won't make it to the next level. And I have a different set of lenses I'm looking at them than you are. So I'll become a much better coach to you even after I meet the key players on the team. So in general, we don't have any contracts or agreements in our coaching, but guys recognize, wow, they're giving me better counsel like every month we go along because I trust them more. Number one, I'm dropping the pose. Mm -hmm. And number two, the key players, you know, are kind of becoming part of that process too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're, you're sinking into the culture, which then allows you to, to coach up. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I want to, I want to back up to the last, um, statement that you were making, we were talking about things that kill the potential of killer teams being killer teams. And you talked about approachability, coachability. What is, you know, the vast majority of people who listen to this podcast are the vast majority are probably communications directors. Uh, There are some senior pastors and some executive pastors that would tune in, but there are people that would typically find themselves somewhere in the middle of the leadership uh, ladder within their organization. If I'm that guy or that gal, and I am recognizing that there's some level of toxicity, there's some level of conflict, there's there's something that isn't healthy for our team. I mean, and granted, there are all kinds of books about leading up and, and that sort of yeah. thing. But if I want to be a catalyst for helping my team get better, but I'm not the head coach of the team, what are some practical things that I can do that would I can buy a copy of the book and give it to my boss or, <laughs> or fill in the blank, Sean, suggest, what else can I do? Yeah. I wouldn't suggest that in general. Um, I hated it when it, as a senior pastor, when any staff member or church member came up, here's a book I think you need to read. You know, there's always an agenda there. <laughs> it's awful when it's the Bible too. When they hand you the Bible and say, I don't think you're reading the same Bible yeah, I'm reading. Right, right, I've, right. Had, I've had that happen. <laughs> I tell, here's, if you're a second or third chair leader in the, in the church, you know, you need to know what I tell senior pastors. I tell senior pastors, you do not need to listen to most people in your church. Don't listen to them. Only listen to people in your church, including on your team, who lo- they have to meet three requirements, three fundamental requirements. They have to meet all three. They got to love God with all their hearts. They got to love the vision with all their hearts. And they got to love you with all their hearts. If they don't meet all three, don't listen to them. If you, your, your mandate is to find you a few people that meet all three requirements and listen to them. So if you're a second or third chair leader, flip that around. If I want to be listened to, the first thing my leader needs to hear is not what they're doing wrong, not all the things that I see that are broken, not to point out their blind spot. The first thing I've got to communicate is, Pastor, I'm with you. I'm for you. I'm behind you. I love you. I got your back no matter what. And no matter what kind of dialogue we have behind closed doors, when we walk out, I got you, you know, and them feeling that consistently, but not just implied, like spoken, (laughs) spoken. And that will give you access to your leader that 999 out of 1,000 do not get, do not get, you know. And I have found, you know, majority of the time, he'll listen, she'll listen. If, If they know you love your love God, you're pursuing God, you totally are in love with the vision, and you love them. And I'm telling senior pastors, if they meet all three requirements, listen to them, listen to them. And you're, the second thing I would say is their response is not your responsibility. 
your responsibility is to speak the truth in love. If you're not doing that, then you're part of the problem. If you're living in fear of your job, rather than speaking the truth in love in biblical community, you're becoming part of the issue. So I also get calls from second and third chair leaders. And I'm like, have you told your pastor that? Oh, no, no, I would never do that. Well, you owe it to him as a human being. Just your, do you want him to get better? Do you have hopes that he could get better? Do you believe God can do anything? Well, he uses the church, you know? And so if you meet those three requirements, you need to go to him. You need to go to her and begin with what's right. (laughs) That's where every coaching conversation should start. But then say, I see some things. I want what's great for you. Uh, It bothers me sometimes what I hear people say or think or whatever. I read the room, you know, whatever. I got your back and I think I can help you with a couple blind spots if you're open to it, you know, and don't say no for them. Let them decide whether they're going to be insecure, defensive, dismissive, whatever. That's not our responsibility, but to speak the truth in love in hopes we could win that person back, Scripture says. I hope that's in the bandwidth somewhere, spectrum of what you were looking for. Yeah, absolutely. Now, let me follow up that question with, if I'm on a team, this is this is going in a, maybe a, a totally different direction. But if I'm on a team, and let's say I I believe that I am doing those things, and I have been doing those things, but I'm not seeing the change organizationally that I, I want or feel like I need to see changing, what are the cues for me? that I might be on the wrong bus? What are the things that might be cues for me that let me know that, hey, this team might not ever get to be a killer team and I might need to go look for a killer team somewhere else? Yeah. Why why are 75, 85% of churches in North America plateaued or declining? You know, because the leader's defensive and insecure and won't learn anything from anybody, won't get a coach, isolated, doing the way he did things 20 years ago and, and is hell bent on doing it. So it's deep change or slow death. So I've got to decide to stay here and die a slow death or leave. It's a free country. I'd rather live in a van down by the river, Bart, (laughs) than serve under a leader that won't listen to anybody. Uh, It's a free country (laughs) in our country. You know, you can work anywhere. You can do anything and I'm, I'm not going to bide my best years of my life, my greatest potential under a leader that won't listen. Jesus said, if they won't listen, shake the dust off your sandals and move on to the next one. You know, leave in the name of Jesus. You know, if you've spoken your peace, and that's a big if, if you've spoken your peace, not taking a shot on the way out. I'm talking about like a true appeal and desire to lead up and create a win. And help this leader peel back his blind spots. And there's been nothing, nada, crickets, you know, or passive aggressiveness, you know, all this stuff that happens that's unhealthy. Retribution, perhaps, you know, or at the least nothing, you know, I got to decide, am I just going to die and be okay with that? And learn to kind of submit that and, and maybe together as a collective mission, we're still can accomplish a lot. Or do I want to go serve under a leader that I can potentially impact up, you know, because there are lots of great pastors out there that are not insecure, that are not defensive, that will listen, that are collaborative. There's a lot of great guys out there and gals that will, that will listen to you. (laughs) So go for it. Wow. There's truth and nuggets for everybody who's listening right there. (laughs) I just ruined some person's life today. (laughs) I mean, you know, Jason and I have been around the church world. You've been around the church world. And and we've seen people come out of church and out of ministry amazingly wounded, like really, really hurt. And a lot of times the reason that the wounds are so deep is that there is a an unbridled loyalty to the church and an unbridled loyalty to the mission and the person on the staff team doesn't have enough self-respect or believe that it's okay to leave if and when things are unhealthy for them. But at the same time, I've also seen those people leave and go somewhere else 
and plug in and find that the patterns are repeated without being self-aware enough that maybe they are contributing to some of the reason that sure. their situation isn't healthy and it's not the best for them. So it does take a level of, of self-awareness to know that, you know, if I go from church A to church B to church C and I'm miserable in every single one of those and it's not working out, I might be the common yeah. denominator. Yeah, exactly. Um, but that's, that's not always the case, but it is sometimes the case. Uh, Henry Cloud, I'm, I recommend uh, the book Necessary Endings by Henry Cloud. Mm -hmm. You know, he said it takes a healthy, self-aware person to recognize it's time to exit before everyone else comes to that conclusion. Yeah. Yeah. In my, oh, it's, in my, in my pre-ministry, in my pre, I, I boast on this. I had about five years in the corporate world before I went into ministry. And I had a pretty high level role in the organization that I worked in. And I can honestly say in the five years that I led this team, I never had to let anyone go. But I did have a lot of those conversations with staff where I said, you might need to think about whether or not this is the best long-term fit for you before somebody else has to make that decision for you. That's right? exactly right. Clarity, you know, with your team members allows room for the Holy Spirit to speak to them more loudly and for them to come to the conclusion that this is no longer, you know, a fit for them. And it's always better for them to come to that conclusion than you. But they can't come to that conclusion most of the time unless you are painting a clear picture of where we're going and what you need from them and where they're falling short what their blind spots are, you know, what you need from them in the future, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And when you shy back from that, you're harming the church, but you're harming that person as well because they're running in a lane that doesn't put a smile on their face every day. If they're in over their heads from a capacity standpoint or the vision has shifted a little bit over time and they are no longer 1,000% mutually devoted to this thing, it's going to suck the life out of them too. Not only their team, their department, but that human being. That's, there's a reason why they call them preacher's kids, you know, because you got you got this man, this woman running outside of their lane and then they get inside, they get in the car and grumble every Sunday afternoon to their kids, you know? So we do them a favor by getting really clear about what, what the future looks like for us and for them. It's not, it's not to their detriment. It should never be to their detriment. It's for their good. And for the organization's good, we we lean into courage. No. Well, let's let's land this, Sean. Thank you for your ministry, for your uh, your years of experience sharing this with. Just today, I've learned a lot, and hopefully, you have too. As the listeners are listening to this, how, how can how can they get in touch with you with your organization and and buy the book? Sure, uh, KillerTeamBook.org is the book. I, I self-published this one so I could literally send them the first one for the cost of my shipping and the print and the, the, the printing and the shipping. So the first one's on me, really. Wow. Um, uh, there, and then you can get extra books for your team and you know all of that. But I just say to guys, like the book is never intended to be a fix-all. You know that's one of the detriments in our society right now. Right. Our, the next book I read, the next conference I go to. You know, the next podcast I listen to, okay, and I lead to, mm -hmm. you know, but it you need a coach. You need a coach. So we'd love to talk with you about that. You know, courageouspastors.com slash strategy. We'll jump on a Zoom call. We'll assess us whether it be a good time or fit to talk with you, your team about coaching you. That's our end game every time, you know, not to write books or speak or do podcasts, but to coach leaders. Mm. Excellent. Sean, I appreciate you. I know you're busy and, and your schedule's full. So thank you for, for uh, being on this podcast and, and writing this book and sharing uh, some of the details with us. Appreciate thank it. you guys for what you do. Thanks for bringing your gift, you know, to the church. And wow, I can think of a lot of former staff members that could have used, you know, your coaching, your help, your support, your insight, you know, over the years. So I just praise God for what he's doing in and through you all. Amen. Thanks, sir. Appreciate the opportunity to hang out with you today. And we'll just, and, and calling you friend. Thanks, John. Yeah, Bart. <laughs>